Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, we are glad to have you as a part of this session. We are going to talk about the um, Kubernetes, OVAS Kubernetes top 10 uh, challenges with the CNCF projects. Um, if you like, you can scan the code as a part of these slides and it takes you through the, the entire slides with the entire information. Again, uh, maybe you can uh, find it helpful. Yep. As an agenda that we are going to talk about the key security organization, what is the OWASP, and addressing the OWASP Kubernetes top 10 challenges with the CNCF project. This is a list of the top 10 um, challenges with the uh, OWASP Kubernetes, just for your reference at the beginning of this talk. So just to introduce ourselves real quick, um, my name is Hilary Lipsig. I'm a principal site reliability engineer at Red Hat. Um, and of course, I'm accompanying Ali Reza. And my name is Ali Reza Rahmani, um, senior cloud success architect, have an experience in working in the different continent from the Middle East to Asia Pacific and North America. In addition to the solution architect or cloud success architect, I'm a um, faculty member and curriculum developer in several uh, Canadian college, and this profile picture is my beautiful uh, big boy, which I missed him two years ago, but as a coincident today is at the anniversary that uh, two years I don't have. It. For this reason, I prefer to have him as a part of this talk and session. So uh, before we kind of get into the, the meat of the thing, um, the, the pattern for this talk is going to be slightly atypical. Um, we're going to introduce a concept of a fictitious company, um, and then we're essentially going to um, you know, play the parts of, of you know, person working at the company and security consultant, and we'll take you through a decision tree um, around CNCF projects and this OWASP top 10. So kind of stick with us as we basically uh, live action role play on the stage. <laughs> Key security uh, organization, before talking about the OVASP top 10, I want to just uh, name and introduce, um, I mean, that they're talking about the several uh, companies that uh, have a contribution to the uh, security concept, like the CIS, like the NISD, CSA, CISA, and also OVASP. Um, these organizations have a, a great contribution with cre creating the benchmark, best practices, guidelines, and recommendations which helping the organization to promote and enhance the security concept in the cloud, in the Kubernetes, and microservices. Just for your reference, SP800-190 is one of the, uh, those documents that's coming from the NIST and also um, Center for Internet Security. Uh, it's a best practices that offering by the CIS organization. Regarding the OVASP, OVASP is an abbreviation for the Open Worldwide Application Security Project, which is um, funded uh, in 2001. And this is an open community um, uh, dedicated to the enabling the organization to enhancing the security with applying the uh, best practices. And their vision is no more insecure software. Exactly, I just extract this information from their website. And the mission is um, empowering the organization with collaboration, with education and tools to promote the security. Right, so getting into our, our fictitious company, right? So I, uh, in this scenario, represent the platform engineering team for Open Red Sphere, um, and it is a small startup working in the AI space. Um, like most startups, has been doing things kind of quick and dirty, a little bit, you know, people wearing lots of different hats and doing things maybe outside of their realm of expertise. And as we're trying to take our new product to launch, we've decided to bring in a cybersecurity expert to ensure that we are not opening ourselves up for, you know, liability or potential disasters. 
Before uh, going and talking about this OVAS, just for, the, for your information, there are a, a couple of projects, some of them it's sitting in the, in the, as a graduated, some of them as an incubating and the sandbox. And there are always, there are overlapping between these projects to addressing the, the issue. Then in, in reviewing the slides that we are going just review the project one time, but maybe you will see the name of this project several times during the address, the different uh, threats and challenges with the OWASP top 10. Right, so first, first up, right, insecure workload configurations. Um, do you want to, there we go. Right, so as one does when sometimes running things a little bit quick and dirty, we went ahead and let our workloads run as root. Um, and we're not really, uh, maybe using, uh, being careful about resource constraints and, and causing some other problems. So this was the first thing that our security consultant identified and he recommended certain mitigations. Just for your reference, I mentioned we put the which part of the Kubernetes components you will see the insecure uh, workload configuration is happening in the pod. Uh, section. Then, if you run the um, image or uh, you add the uh, content in the content, the security content as a root user or privileged user, you should expect to see this uh, this problem. Just uh, for your information, uh, because it's exactly mentioned in the OBAS um, uh, website that there is a good report that published by Red Hat almost two weeks ago, 2024, and it's talking about the what's challenge or talking about the, um, uh, the people in the DevOps and uh, professional services that facing with the Kubernetes security issues. And as it mentioned that 60% of the respondent for this survey and reports um, have experienced this problem as a misconfiguration incident in the Kubernetes environment in last 12 months. But what's the recommended uh, by the OWASP? This is a running the workload as a non um, non-root user, non-privilege mode. And this allowed the privilege escalation. We are going to have a look at um, which CNCF project can address these issues. This is a list of the project. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time at the beginning for talking about this project very quickly. Just for your convenience, I put the, um, the information about the which of these projects are in graduated, incubating, and the sandbox. And the purpose, we, we tried not only talking about the graduated project, but also to promote incubating project and bring the uh, more contribution or more contributor uh, to the, to the um, incubating and sandbox. Uh, the first one is at the OPA. The OPA is at the graduated uh, project. And um, for deploying the OPA or using the OPA, you should use the REGO as a as a policy language for deploying. The good point of this project that you can use this OPA in, for the entire stack. It's not only the uh, Kubernetes, if you have an infrastructure, if you have, a, uh, for example, networking, then you are able to use OPA for your entire stack. But keep in mind, you should uh, learn and know about the how to write the policy in the Rego. The Kiverno, it's an incubating project, and the beauty of the Kiverno is that it's, first of all, it's only belong and uh, it's uh, only applicable to the Kubernetes, not any other, for example, um, uh, networking or et cetera, and there is no need to learn about any specific language. Then uh, with a command like the git, like the customize, like the kubectl, you can simply apply this policy. Falco is at the uh, security runtime engine. It means that um, with, with the OPA and with the Kiverno, we are able to control the creating the uh, resources. Um, before creating the resources, we check the content of those resources or, or the object. With the Falco, what we are trying to achieve is a runtime security. Then it means that it's using the um, getting benefit and taking advantage of the eBPF and some custom rules. They detect the, uh, for example, problem and it can send an alert. It's a graduated and still it's a good uh, to have this project. 
There are two other projects, Cube Escape and Cube Warden, that uh, one of them is at the security platform. You can, uh, I'm talking about the Cube Escape. It's a security platform and you can have a risk analysis, you can have a uh, compliance checking. And the beauty of this uh, sandbox project that you can uh, use the CIS benchmark or MITRE, ten, uh, MITRE attack, sorry, MITRE attack, uh, for example, a framework and check your entire Kubernetes with this sandbox. Uh, Cube Warden, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a, another sandbox project. Um, if you want, for example, your developer is expert in the Golang, in the Java, then you, they can create the policy uh, based on those language that they are expert. But the only uh, condition and uh, requirements that because it's using and running in the VASM, actually web assembly uh, format, then your, the language should be compilable or uh, they should be compiled and run in the, in the VASM. This is the cube part. Then, uh, based on this information, which project do you think that we need, your unit actually, for your workload? Right, so thinking about holistically my organization and where we are in terms of uh, staffing and skill set, right, and, and also regulatory needs, which on ours would not be significant, I would probably choose Keyverno because that reduces the number of things that my team needs to learn. Okay. And I would recommend to use the Falcos. It's, it's right, a well, they do time. different things. Okay. Um, so that's a good point. Um, you know, obviously at this at this stage of our conversation, I am now seriously considering Falco, but I may not be sold on it yet. I need to see what else it can do. Okay. Sure. So then, supply chain vulnerabilities, right? What did I just say? I said that we are a you know small startup AI, which means that we are pulling in a lot of open source dependencies. Um, so things that are coming from people that we may not necessarily know, and whether intentionally or unintentionally, may not necessarily be trustworthy. Right. So uh, when I say trustworthy, obviously, first thing on there is uh, image composition. Uh, image integrity and 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 software like vulnerabilities. Those those are the things that you are going to we are going to need the most help with because we're really dependent on these open source projects as a small company. Um, but we need to know that we're not, like I said earlier, introducing uh, liability into our stack. The mitigation strategy for this or the second problem is that the image integrity, uh, image signing, we should be ensured that we download and deploy the trusted image. It's a key point of this challenge or the second challenge of the OWASP top 10. Uh, and also we want to ensure that because we download this image from the uh, registry or from the, uh, for example, trusted registry, we want to ensure that uh, this image during the download, during the, for example, uh, deploying its not going to be tampered or it's not going to be unauthorized access or change the, uh, the, the, this image. Then another recommendation is enforcing policy. Definitely OPA, Kiverno, and the other policy engine suitable for this um, um, problem, but let's have a look to see that what's the other project from the CNCF. We are skipping the Kiverno, Falco, OPA. The new project that we are going to talk about that it's a harbor, which is a graduated project. This harbor, it's a registry or image registry service, trusted image registry service, and definitely um, uh, you can um, when you um, you can push and pull the image, and it, it's going to be scanning those image, and you can use that uh, for the integration. In total, and um, the update. Um, framework, it's a, another two projects, one of them is graduated, another one is incubating, and for the in total, I can tell you that when you create the image from the uh, writing, compiling, testing, deploying, in each stage you are able to check the cryptographic signing of each stage, then to ensure that you have a um, actually uh, right image. And the update framework that it's using for the uh, applying the, um, the right and the correct without any problem with, with, your, with the package, then before downloading, before, for example, applying this package, the, uh, the software will be, will be checked. Then, uh, these two projects also is a part of the, uh, uh, the second challenge. Then, 
it's up to you which one do you want to select in addition to the keyword no, and Falco. <laughs> well, you can see he's decided for Falco for me, right? So obviously we're gonna get there. <laughs> um, right, so what I'm hearing from what my security consultant has just said is that we're, we're covering things from multiple different vectors, right? Uh, we're, we're hitting them from both before the workloads actually are on the cluster and then also during runtime. So um, with that information at hand, I, I think it's really important to have you know, pull in something like like Tough and in Toto. But you heard him also reference uh, a known and secure um, image registry. And that made me, as a, a person in my, my fictitious shoes, realize that I had thought so hard about uh, the dependencies I was pulling in, but not very hard about the own Im my own images that I was generating. Fortunately, the technologies that he's been recommending also cover the images that my company would be generating for our software. Um, and also, that allows me to realize that we can use Harbor as a you know safe, secure image registry where we can keep our images as a, in a trusted location while also continue to guarantee their security posture through its continuous scanning. Cool. The third one. Right, so again, and this, I, I, I mentioned this because this happens, you know, very regularly, as, as a small company with a lot of people, you know, doing things outside their usual realm of expertise, um, you know, maybe going above and beyond their standard, you know, role definitions, uh, we've, you know, found that, you know, people tend to have a really broad spectrum uh, level of access. And as we are positioning ourselves in a competitive market where security is really in focus, we need to start, you know, reducing that and breaking it down, you know, breaking it down into what is actually really necessary, you know, most amount of actions, least amount of access Access is, is typically the guidance that we, we follow here. Um, and so we've asked our consultant, like what tools exist to help us manage those at scale? Cool. Uh, for addressing these challenges, um, we are not going only talk about the just stopping and checking the content of the, uh, for example, resource that we are going to deploy in the Kubernetes, but also we want to see that what project also can help us to, for example, um, based on the best practices, based on the, for example, recommendation and guidelines can um, help us to secure our environment. Then, oops, sorry, uh, the new project for um, uh, number third of this uh, thread list is it the key colloc. Key clock, uh, it's an incub uh, incubating project. Then uh, if you want to deploy the single sign-on, if you do want to uh, deploy the federation, if you want to integrate with the other, for example, um, IDP or identity provider like the Entra ID, the new name of the Active Directory, or you want to integrate with the LDAP, then you can go with the key clock. It's not only that uh, it, um, you are able to integrate with the other, um, um, for example, LDAP and uh, Active Directory or Intra ID, but also you can use this as a uh, brokering agent. Then you can use as a, for example, the agent for authentication in the social, um, um, in the, in the social networking. Then, in addition to this feature, you can have a role-based access control. Then you can, for example, uh, assign the right role based on the, uh, the level of the, uh, or uh, the entity that wants to get access to those resources. Oh, no. Very quickly, it's fast. Okay, we are number four. Right? Yeah. There we go. Here we go. Right. So, you know, obviously, uh, Key Cloak uh, would be a very, a, a very obvious decision there. It complements the other tools nicely. Um, and so that we don't have to, you know, spend any time with that. So that gets us kind of back to number four, which is going to start, you know, you're just going to start realizing that a lot of these things kind of have a theme, which is, um, when people try to move too quickly and they don't have good processes set up, it allows you to make very easy minor mistakes such as, you know, uh, a lack of, you know, and, and which can be because of a lack of centralized policy enforcement is really what I, how I would put that. Um, and so what we're really seeing is that we've got, you know, some misconfigurations around the place, obviously that kind of, you know, goes back to the, the earlier points. Um, and then some places where even though we're not a highly regulated company, we're not maybe in compliance with known best practices. 
For addressing the uh, number four of this threat list, uh, the recommendation is uh, uh, defining the clear policy, um, avoiding unauthorized access, regular audit and monitoring, and continuous improvement with applying the patch, and etc. Well, uh, in addition to those um, policy engine enforcement, we want to introduce to uh, two new projects. Those two are uh, graduated project. One of them is Argo, and another is Flux. Then we want to have a control uh, with the GitOps approach or uh, rules uh, for controlling the. The R, R policy or deployment, uh, this policy. Then Argo and Flux are two other projects. Just just let you know, in the Argo, we have an Argo CD for the uh, continuous deployment. It's a, a Kubernetes continuous deployment. We have an Argo rollout. We are, have an Argo uh, workflow. Then um, you can choose between these two um, projects, between the Flux and Argo. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> Uh, so for me personally, I would pick um, Argo. It's not to say they're mutually exclusive for those of people who are like, well, wait a minute in the back. It's, you know, we're just keeping it simple right now. Um, so I would choose Argo because, um, again, it's a complementary tool, right? So you, if, you're deploy if you need to change your policies that OPA will use, you can use uh, GitOps to, you know, have those changes propagate through in a, in a continuous and automated fashion. That's all very nice. You can use GitOps um, and, and to you know, star as code as well. Um, so I'm a big proponent of GitOps. I like it a lot. I, I see that as, as something that we can you know, employ creatively here to, to guarantee our security compliance standing. So that would be something that I would pick. Cool. Then Argo will be your choice. Argo would be my choice. That's good. So logging and monitoring, I think that everybody knows that this is something that you have to very deliberately uh, plan for and write in and is something that sometimes you don't realize what you're missing until you're actually trying to deal with things that go wrong, right? Um, so as uh, you know, a younger company at this stage, uh, we would be doing way more testing of way different kinds um, and, and really getting ourselves ready for a go-to-market strategy. And so this is where we would start seeing that maybe we're kind of slow to detect failures um, and if we're starting to set kind of some, um, like, uh, to use an SRE word, some SLOs around how quickly we're able to respond to issues, um, then, you know, this, is, this can be a really big problem for us. Um, but, you know, you can't just grab every single thing um, because logs are critical data and sometimes may contain PII, um, which is why we asked our security consultant to help us do something with, with logging that also didn't, um, you know, violate known best practices. The recommendation from the OWASP top 10 is uh, having definitely uh, the telemetry. The telemetry could be including the logs, could be uh, metrics, and uh, tracing files. This is a highly recommended, not only for the uh, reactive approach, but also for the proactive approach, creating the dashboard and providing this dashboard to the SRE team to give an opportunity or tools to detect the failure or, uh, you know, um, be advanced before this failure happening. In this list, uh, we have a several projects. Um, ju just for your information, we have a, uh, totally, we have a 190 project as a part of the CNCF projects. Uh, eight of them are archived, 26 of them are um, graduated, 37 are incubating, and 119 projects, CNCF projects, are in sandbox. Then. It's out of our time if we want to go and talking about the sandbox project, just we um, pick some of them. For example, um, for the um, recommended, it's a Prometheus, which is using for collecting the metrics. Uh, but keep in mind, this project, um, Prometheus, as a graduated uh, project, keeping the data in, in memory. Then for keeping the data in the long storage or long-term storage, you need to have a cortex, which is the, uh, it can be um, integrated very well with the, with the Prometheus for keeping the metrics in, and storing those metrics. Uh, Yager is it the distributed uh, tracing platform, Fluency 
if you have a log from the Nginx, from the syslogs, and you want to uh, publish this log and send it, this log to the uh, MongoDB, to the, uh, for example, uh, Elasticsearch, the uh, Fluency is a, is a, it could be the choice. But uh, in addition to this project, Open Telemetry, it's that the projects that it's in incubating maturity level right now, which you can collect the metrics, logs, and uh, traces. Then between these projects, it's up to you that which one do you want to prefer. So, and again, acknowledging that these are not all mutually exclusive decisions, right? Like, I'm going to just very freely acknowledge that you can use these things together. Um, but, you know, for, again, my company, I mentioned earlier, I chose Kiverno because I wanted my team to have to learn less things. Um, so for that same reason, I would choose Open Telemetry in this situation because it, it does a little bit of everything, um, and that allows my team to have to learn fewer things. kind of creates a little bit more of a sustainable level of technical debt for us. So, uh, broken authentication, right? Um, there was some, we, we mentioned earlier, people had permissions they didn't need because we, we were doing things kind of like everybody d is doing everything. Um, but we also found that, you know, we had some additional things around that we didn't know the history of. Um, so, you know, this one refers, references service accounts. Service accounts just kind of existing, um, maybe created with the best of intentions, but then no, no controls, um, no auditing, no any things of things in the past. Now we have these things around and we don't really know why they were there. Um, and we need to, to work on, like, cleaning that up and making sure these things don't happen in the future. This problem is happening uh, when um, in the in the uh, Cube API server components of the Kubernetes. Then um, the strategy for or mitigation strategy is using the multi-factor authentication, using the strong password policy. Definitely, we can achieve uh, through the using the um, Kiverno policy or OPA policy, and um, it's highly recommended that managing the token uh, not or not using the token outside of the cluster just inside the cluster and using the role-based access control to address this issue. Then um, as a part of the project the, um, for the detecting uh, the issue or the security issue, Falco, the key clock, is it there for deploying and using the RBAC or role-based access control? And also Cert Manager also is a, another project that we are able to use in this uh, situation that we can automatically provision and manage the TLS certification, which is right now it's in incubating maturity level. Right, so obviously we know, right, we've already decided on, on Keycloak and Falco, that's great for us that we don't have to learn something new, but TLS certificates are an important factor. Um, for pretty much every Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so, you know, well-spotted security consultant, we're gonna add that one to our list. So network segmentation, networking for uh, me specifically uh, is always a, a very mysterious thing, right? It's um, one thing that you think you understand it and then everything is broken and it turns out it's DNS, right? So security within this, this mystery black box that is how computers talk to each other is uh, one of the challenges that a lot of, uh, especially young companies who may not have like networking experts will experience. The recommendation from the OVASP is uh, deploying the uh, networking policy for sure using the um, service mesh multi-cluster approach if it's possible to segregate and separate the uh, workload and deploying the workload in the different cluster depends on the nature of the, um, the application and uh, deploying the CNI or container network interface plugin. We have a great graduated project in, the, in this um, category of the networking uh, segmentation. Istio, Cilium, and Linker are three graduated uh, projects, uh, which uh, definitely all of them are able to uh, deploy the network seg segmentation. You are able to deploy the uh, control, the egress, ingress, communication between pod and etc. Some of them, uh, or uh, for example, Istio has a, uh, has a full dashboard, and you can, for example, get access to the dashboard through, through the Kayali. And uh, with the Cilium, 
um, it's using the eBPF in the background. Actually, it's well, well, uh, well integrated with the with the eBPF, and it's a. Uh, uh, a very small footprint for the deployment. However, for the Linkerd and still, it's using the side card for deploying this uh, service mesh and uh, network segmentation. So, uh, in my situation, uh, I would choose Cilium personally. Um, this comes down to a few things. EBPF is a big driver for that. Again, the slightly less complex uh, deployment nature of that project is another reason. Um, so, that would be my pick in my fictitious shoes. Speaking of difficult to manage things and GitOps, um, <laughs> secrets management. Um, that's definitely been something that I think a lot of companies have, have really uh, struggled with is, is how do you, you need passwords for things to work, but how do you use passwords securely because they're kind of inherently not secure, and whether that's a literal password or a secret or a token, et cetera, the, the whole thing's kind of, they have some challenges, right? The recommendation for um, this issue, it's storing the sensitive uh, data securely. This sensitive data securely um, uh, should be um, encrypted. This encryption could be a transit, could be happen at rest. This is a what highly recommended and uh, implementing the rule-based access control restriction and having for sure the regular audit access, it's a highly recommended uh, from the OVAS top 10. But the project uh, that in here that personally I like about that is that the uh, SP fee, SP fee and Spire actually um, it's deploying the in addition to the cert manager that it's deploying the um, mutual uh, TLS. We can use the um, SP fee and Spire. The, which it's deploying the workload identity. It's able or you can um, authenticate your macro services without storing the password and without having the API key, you can go with this um, uh, new project, which is a graduated. And also we had a, um, actually one session that run by the Red Hatters and talking about this specifically regarding this project. It happened, uh, or they run this project, this uh, tutorial yesterday. Right, so I mean, that was an obvious, you know, easy solve thing. Sorry, workload I didn't identity. ask you. <laughs> I mean, there was nothing to ask, right? Workload identities are great. 10 of 10 recommend. Um, and that gets us moving right along to um, another misconfiguration around cluster components. So, again, you're going to notice, you know, this Venn diagram is starting to look a lot more like a circle. Um, some of these basic, you know, simple mistakes that, that people can make when they're new to a technology or when they're trying to move quickly. Um, you know, in our fictitious company, we found ourselves making some of these same very easy to make mistakes. This is why we, you know, hired a security consultant, had, a re had this review, went through these items. Um, and hence why he's going to recommend some mitigation strategies and tools for us. Disabling the anonymous uh, authentication enforced the strict authorization, restrict network access, and secure configuration practices is highly recommended as a uh, mitigation strategy for the OWASP top 10. And well, there is no new projects here. No new actually. projects, right? We're already covered. We told you this would happen. Uh, good for us. We're picking uh, highly reusable technologies. Again, that gives us you know, less things to learn, better technical debt levels while maintaining security posture, which is really important for a platform team. Cool. And so then the last one, I mentioned earlier that we are using you know, open source uh, projects. We're pulling them into our, our, you know, our offering. Um, that comes with a whole series of risks, which can include uh, vulnerabilities and those you know, things that we really rely on, um, and maybe things that we don't super well understand as things go further and further up the dependency tree. Mitigation strategy is using the uh, common uh, vulnerability uh, database, uh, continuous scanning, minimize the third party dependency, downloading the images from the trusted registry, and the patch management. Well, uh, from the list, um, again, um, this is an Argo that uh, recommended Flux. 
Falco and Cubescape because that uh, with, the, with the, for example, I want to add some information about this Cubescape that you can use the CLI and uh, for example, using the CIS benchmark, using the MITRE attack as a part of the CLI, you, you can deploy this Cubescape through the Helm chart and, as a, and integrate with the CI-CD pipeline. In the different stages, it's, it's able to check, for example, each stage. So in conclusion, right, for this last one, we saw that we already had some technologies up that um, you know, we'd already picked, so we knew we were going to reuse them. But what he mentioned there that was kind of key at the end was Cubescape is sort of looking at things from a different place. And so some of these technologies did things in very similar ways or did similar behaviors, but they did them in different like sections of the software development life cycle. So that's one other thing, like as you know, somebody in uh, you know, a platform engineer's shoes, I might not necessarily jump on bringing a sandbox project into my, um, into my ecosystem um, to avoid complexity, to avoid learning new things, to avoid picking up something that doesn't have a community behind it to sustain because I can't do that myself. Um, but it would be something that I would be keeping my eye on at this stage to see if it develops a little bit more into something that I could rely on and adopt. So keep in mind that as security is always changing, best practices is always changing, best tools are always changing, we would always be changing too. Thank you. Any question for us? Go for it. I'll, um, I'll use the mic just in case. Um, I noticed that you chose um, for leveraging Spiffy inside of your architecture, you chose um, Spire. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with um, native capability inside of Cert Manager in order to mint Spiffy IDs? There's a, um, a, a CSI driver that is native to Cert Manager that you can roll alongside Cert Manager called Spiffy CSI driver. That would remove the need for you to run out a whole Spire, Spire server and um, an associated Postgres, PostgreSQL and all of that sort of stuff because it's handled inside of Kubernetes specifically. Is that something you know about? And if so, do you think that would be something that would fit well into the architecture? So it is something I had heard about actually at this conference and I decided I wasn't changing my talk that late in the game, <laughs> to be really frank with you. Um, but that goes into that continuous evaluation thing. So yes, I have heard some things about that. I've also heard that there are some problems with some things not necessarily speaking to their actual standards versus speaking to the implementation. I've heard that there's some friction in all of that and I didn't personally have time to go research all of that to make an informed different decision other than what I'd already decided on. So that was really kind of what happened with that one. It's like I heard about it and then I heard some other stuff and I was like, I don't have time. I'm already here. This is what we're doing. Theoretically though, I could absolutely change my decision because what you mentioned is a more simple stack, right? Less things and less can be more, especially when you're dealing with an IDP. So it would absolutely be something that I would like very highly reconsider. Yeah, I think especially whilst um, Spiffy is still something that where it's developing in terms of the, the different services in, in, inside of a, an environment that can leverage it already, um, we're still not 100% there, so it could be. Yeah, again, it was, like I said, I heard more about it after we got here, and I was like, I'm not changing things, it's too late, I'm going to make, I don't want to be like saying things that are not as well informed as they could be. Um, for anyone interested, there's a talk in about 15, 20 minutes that I'm doing with my friend on Spiffy. Um, I love yeah. that. Animated character called Crush should be fun. Come along. <laughs> Thank you for your, for your question. That was a good question. All right, we'll let you guys get your time back. Thank you so much. Thank you.